uh, you all are very much aware there are uh, three antiplatelet drugs, right? Ticlopidine, aspirin, and clopidogrel. So we all are aware they have a big role to play, especially in the ischemic patients, the patients who all have had uh, ischemic heart disease. So the big question what we are going to discuss today is someone already has had acute coronary syndrome. If you're thinking about the mortality, is there a role of such drugs actually? So what happens is we all are very much aware. So if someone already has had a myocardial infarction, there's a higher rate of subsequent cardiovascular, cardiovascular mortality and also recurrent events, which is compared with the controls. And then, in fact, when they try to see for the cardiovascular events in the first year itself, so what happens is the risk tends to be continuous and it keeps on increasing up to almost five years. And you know what has happened is, in fact, the risk of cardiovascular events is very, very high. And what happens is, in fact, 40% of those recurrent myocardial infarctions. So for example, one, one patient already has had a heart attack. So the chances of having uh, nearly 40% of those patients having recurrent MI tends to occur within two to five years after the index event. So a big question always comes is, uh, what are we going to do? How are we going to take care of those patients? How are, can we help those patients? How can we decrease the rate of death for such patients? So we are already aware very much uh, with plenty of studies which have already shown that myocardial infarction has a significant long-term impact on morbidity and also mortality. In fact, who has had a MI, the average life expectancy tends to come down by 4 to 17 years. 4 to 17 years, in fact. And what will happen is, at least 20% of those patients, once they have had a heart attack, they will die in the coming five years itself. And when you will try to see for the five-year mortality rate, in fact, in those patients, it tends to double. Okay, so that's really, really very significant, in fact. Similarly, if someone is already having associated diabetes, the risk tends to increase even more further. And that is the reason when they try to compare someone having a myocardial infarction or someone who is healthy the life expectancy is reduced by nearly almost 10 years for the ones who suffers a myocardial infarction and that is where the comparison of life expectancy in the life patients aged 60 years it was seen in the this data has been taken from the Framingham heart study so when they further try to compare those healthy people and acute MI people so life expectancy tends to definitely gets reduced, isn't it? So the people have, with the certain age group, we can see it on the left, okay, males, females, uh, the ones healthy and uh, the life expectancy for them. Similarly, the patients with prior, prior myocardial infarction have a higher risk of cardiovascular mortality when they try to compare with the controls. So in this slide, when we try to compare the cardiovascular mortality versus from the time from the event in years, so they see it over here in a clear way that the people who are having a prior myocardial infarction, the risk of cardiovascular mortality keeps increasing, isn't it? It does not getting stagnant and all, it keeps on in fact increasing, okay? And moreover, despite the improvement in survival rate, okay, which is nearly one in eight patients, in fact, like almost, you can say uh, on a rough basis, like 12% of the patients will die within three years of a ST elevation MI. Okay, so that's what we see it over here. In fact, when they try to compare the survival rates post non steam they have not markedly improved. And the rate is almost similar, for example, even for the STEMI or non-STEMI. So as I already showed you in the last figure as well, in the STEMI, 
as well, the same thing progresses. And even in the non-ST elevation MIE as well, the same thing tends to continue. In fact, when they try to see for the index events, so for example, 20% of the patients with ACS will have died in the five years of the index event. So for example, if there are 100 people who had a acute coronary syndrome, when they try to do a their follow-up for the next five years, almost 20% of those people will be dead. So, so much is the mortality associated with the ACS, not just acute mortality, even the long-term mortality as well. So, we can already clearly see. So, the mortality of a patient having unstable angina, of course, is least. And STEMI is worst, okay? And STEMI is really, really worst. After that comes is the ST elevation MI. So then they try to do a observational study, which is called as a OSS registry, uh, based in Japan, and they try to see for the acute MI uh, for up to five years. And then they saw that recurrent MI tends to more than double the risk of five-year all-cause mortality, and that's what we see in this graph as well. So, for example, the time after discharge in days when they try to see for the cumulative rates of all-cause mortality. It keeps increasing and the increase is further higher in the patients who has had reinfarction. So if someone is having a reinfarction, of course, the mortality rate will further increase. Moreover, uh, so when they try to even compare the cumulative cardiac mortality rate, which is seen on the this axis over here, the y-axis, and similarly, the days from the PCI to recurrent myocardial infarction. So what happens is up to one year, it was decreasing, but after one year, it starts to increase, right? So what is happening is, up to, uh, on an overall basis, the ST elevation MI patient with recurrent MI have a high five-year cardiovascular mortality, irrespective of whether the recurrent MI occurs two to one year or more than one year after the PCI. Um, I think uh, I had already stressed in some of my previous lectures that diabetes is like a coronary artery disease equivalent, right? So this is itself like an independent risk factor which can be causing, in fact, you know, a severe jump in the uh, not just incidence of myocardial infarction but also the mortality and the morbidity as well. So what happens is, similarly, when they try to see over here, the patient, someone having a diabetic, someone not having a diabetes. So how much is the percentage increase which we observe over here? So we can clearly observe over here, there's a gap of almost 18%. 18%. In fact, so, and the of course, when you see it over here, the this curve which is going all over is linear and continuous in fact as well. So, now trying to talk about South Asia, uh, what about the Indian population? So what happens is when they try to see for the eight standardized cardiovascular death rate of nearly 272 people per 1 lakh population, in fact, it is one of the highest in the whole world. And in fact, so, so for example, in the whole world, it is like 235. However, in India, what is happening is it's like 272. So, almost a difference of 37 patients per lakh. And in fact, majority of the patients, majority of such patients having the cardiovascular mortality, they tend to die of ischemic heart disease and also stroke, and which is nearly like 83%. And the ratio of the IHD to stroke mortality is significantly higher than the global average. And that is comparable to that of the Western industrialized countries, in fact. And the problem is, like, uh, even when you talk about just the last two decades, so what has happened is the number of years which is lost uh, to the cardiovascular disease has increased from by, like, nearly 60%. 60% means, for example, two decades back, like, there were only 23.52 uh, million years which was lost. Right now, it has increased to 37 million. So, always a big question comes. Is there a role of these antiplatelet drugs which we are using for such patients? So, in 21st century, what do we use is called as a evidence-based medicine. 
So in evidence-based medicine, you need to be able to show the evidence. And if you're able to show the evidence, that is what is going to be used everywhere, in fact. So do, is there any evidence for that? Uh, so what happens is, antiplatelet drugs, they are divided into various groups on the basis of their action. Thromboxane A2 inhibitors, like the aspirin. Then comes this P2Y12 inhibitors, so which are further classified into reversible, like the law, or the irreversible damage. Irreversible damage is the one which consists of clopidogrel and prosogrel. Similarly, I'm sure you are aware of the usage of GP2B3 inhibitors in the cat lab, like the abciximab, ibtafibatide, or tyrofibab. Similarly, the PDE inhibitors as well, which is silostazole or pyridamol. So, interestingly, our main question comes over here is, what about those P2Y12 inhibitors? So, uh, what is the difference? So, for example, how do the statistics are there for these three wonderful molecules? Let's try to see, for example, for the chlorpidogrel. CURE study was one of the first randomized double-blinded placebo-controlled trial which enrolled almost 12,500 patients following up to one year. And when they tried to see during the months of follow-up, so the person who was taking placebo versus the clopidogrel, so what was happening is the hazard rate, yes, it has uh, become better, okay. However, when you try to see uh, or compare of a patient who was taking clopidogrel plus aspirin, does it help them in preventing cardiovascular mortality post ACS? So what is happening over here? Do you see the difference over here? What is the difference? Of course not. So someone, if you're trying to put them on clopidogrel plus aspirin, the kind of, it's almost the same. So versus aspirin, so for example, when you try to see for the clopidogrel in addition to the aspirin in the acute ACS patient, there's no difference at all. And that is where they tried to launch another study, which is called as Clarity Timmy study. So it was a randomized double blind placebo controlled study enrolling around 3,500 patients. Okay. So even in that, when they try to see or compare uh, the uh, incidence of myocardial infarction and death. So there was no significant difference at all, in fact. So what do we see? It's 0 0.49 p-value. Is it significant? I don't think so. So we are very much aware clopidogrel does not seem to be having a significant effect in preventing mortality. So the other molecule which was already being shown was the although with irreversible damage for the P2Y12 inhibitors was prosegrel. So prosegrel, what can be done? So what happens is in this study as well, they try to see for a huge number of patients. So, so they organize what is called as Triton Timmy 38 study. So in that, they try to see for person with a loading dose and of course a maintenance dose of prosegrel. And also similarly on the other side for clopidogrel loading dose and daily maintenance dose. And they try to do a follow off of median of 14.5 months. And the primary endpoints were composite of cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, stroke, and with the endpoints of non CABG related TB major bleeding or non CABG related TB life threatening bleeding, or even TB major or minor bleeding. So what they observed was the prosegrel was definitely reducing the ischemic events. Awesome. So that's really good, right? However, when they try to see for the risk of major bleeding, so what do you notice over here? So in fact, the risk of major bleeding is higher for the prosegrel, even compared to the clopidogrel. So yes, it's really nice that ischemic events are getting less, but the risk of bleeding is getting more. So what can you do for this? So they try to do further analysis. For example, on the parameters of cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, stroke, stent thrombosis, and also death from the other causes. So when they were trying to uh, have a look, especially for the cardiovascular death, 
as you can see this is not at all significant so what happens is there is no significant reduction when that patient is taking prasugril so we can understand yes prasugril didn't have a significant effect in preventing mortality <coughs> now the question big question comes um, there is already a p2y12 inhibitors uh, which is reversible as well so for example about the tricagrel and that is where the the major clinical trial came was plateau study so plateau study what they tried to see was they tried to enroll the acs patients with unstable angina or non stim okay and all the patients of course had been receiving aspirin in the standard dose which is the maintenance doses okay and they try to randomize and it was a huge study nearly like almost 18600 patients were there and it had like two groups of patients one was clopidogrel the other one was ticagrelor so in that the ticagrelor was being given 180 mg loading dose and after that 90 mg bd maintenance dose okay so when they were giving clopidogrel 30 300 mg loading dose okay and then 75 mg od maintenance so they try to do a follow-up of nearly 277 days okay and the end points were not much different they were almost like the same like the composites of cardiovascular death myocardial infarction stroke the total mortality the stroke or the components of the primary endpoint as well so in this graph what do we see over here this is a very interesting kaplan meier curve so what happens is we try to see for the months after randomization and also the cumulative incidence rate so what was happening is the cumulative incidence rate is much higher for the clopidogrel almost nearly two percent higher so what happens is there is significant reduction in the major cardiovascular event for example on the parameters of cardiovascular death myocardial infarction stroke when a patient was taking ticagrel however those patients when they were taking clopidogrel mm, they had a tough time in fact that's what i was and when they tried to even see for the rate of cardiovascular death and also the rate of all cause mortality with ticagrel there was 21 percent reduction so, and similarly for the cardiovascular death or even for all cause mortality 22 percent don't you think it's really significant like the p-value was 0 0.001 and over here for any cause it was less than 0 0.001 in fact so it's a huge difference right in fact similarly when they try to compare the clopidogrel tricagrel law for also the cardiovascular mortality post acs as well there was significant difference in fact more than 1.1 percent so that is what we see it over here with uh, several months and uh, as you can see so for example when they try to compare for with the cumulative incidence rate as well so once we have been already been seeing all those different different uh, parameters as well so one of the common questions comes to our mind is how about the initial treatment strategy for example if someone has already undergone a pci someone has got a conservative management and someone has already had underwent uh, a bypass therapy like a cabg so these are like three different groups someone is having a invasive therapy someone is having a conservative therapy and someone is already having a bypass so if you're giving a ticket rule all those patients can it really make a difference so what it showed was yes it makes a huge difference and in fact so much so that its p-value is really really significant so there is a huge mortality benefit with ticket law irrespective of the initial treatment strategy so a um, lot of times whenever we give any antiplatelet drugs to a patient we are already always bothered about the uh, bleeding risk how about the bleeding risk for such patients so when they try to similarly see as well, so even on this parameter, Ticagrelor did better uh, versus the uh, clopidogrel, in fact. 
So, you know, the, the difference is not at all much. And in fact, one of the always bigger uh, things about which we are worried about is those diabetic patients. As we have already said, it, those diabetic patients tend to have a lot of those problems. So, can it really help to those patients, in fact? So, when we try to see, so we saw was there was consistent benefit in diabetic subgroup with ticagrelor. Okay. So, so, what do we see over here? So, for example, there are two groups, uh, those diabetics. One group was taking ticagrelor and the other one was taking clopidogrel. Okay. And then we try to see, right. So, this is what we notice over here. Of course, the patients with diabetes, they tend to have a higher risk of cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, even stroke as well. However, we notice is those diabetic patients who are taking ticagrelor, okay, they tend to benefit compared to the ones with clopidogrel, right? So that is why, in fact, uh, when they try to see if, on an overall basis as well for the plateau trial, the primary endpoint benefit with ticagrelor was consistent. So what was seen was Definitely, it tends to benefit those patients. And even in those diabetic patients as well, there's no significant major bleeding risk at all. Isn't it? So, we can notice it over here. And the difference is very much significant as well. So, um, we are able to know what happens is, yes, Ticagrelor had significant reduction in the cardiovascular mortality at the end of one year. But the question always comes is, what about after one year? Okay. Um, okay, so now one question for you all. How many of you are using Ticagrelor actually at your center? Please use the chat box to answer. Okay, so there is one uh, guy, okay, two, who else? Who else is using uh, Ticagrilla? So now, okay, there are only two of you. I'm pretty surprised, I'm sure uh, Ticagrilla would have been used for many more people, in fact. So... What about others? Ticagrelor is not at all being used. Okay, so now my question comes to you guys is, come on, there are so many people who are online. So now my question comes is, how long are you using the Ticagrelor actually? You can use the chat box to answer. So how long do you use the ticker law? One year, okay. Dr. Bilal says one year. How about others? Avinav, how long do you use it? Mm -hmm. So others, as I was, I was asking, okay, two years, two years not. Avinav says two years. Uh, and others, two years, not more than that. Okay, so Avino says this up to two years, and Bilal has said like one year. Any other suggestions from others? I want you guys to be interactive. See, when you're having your lectures, that is the time you can guys can make mistakes as well. Because 
you can interact and you can clear your doubts but later on no one is going to even bother to even if you make mistakes in fact so try to read about whenever you are, guys are given a topic for the lecture try to read about it actually so that will be easier for you guys to understand the things hmm so what about others so someone said to me it was up to one year someone said like okay two years we can use so what about others how long can you use it So already, as you can see on the slide, what has happened is, yes, up to one year, at the end of one year, there's significant reduction. But what about after one year? Okay, I'm getting one more answer, like six months. I know the problem with Tukagura is it's a little expensive medicine. So a lot of people have to be a little bit more cautious about how often or how long should you be able to use about it. So the problem remains same. Hmm. So someone answered me six months. Someone said to me like one year. Someone said to me like up to two year. So what is the exact answer? Only three people have attempted. Not even ten percent. I would say like not even fifteen percent of the total attendance. Hmm. So what happens is that is where this newer study came up. So this is what is called as Pegasus Timi 54. Okay, so in that, the, this study, they try to enroll mostly, mostly uh, elderly people with age of uh, more than 50 years who has had a history of spontaneous myocardial infarction one to three years prior to the enrollment and they also uh, try to see they had at least one atherothrombotic risk factor this was a huge study in which they tried to enroll nearly 21,162 patients and the group had like almost three equally divided number of uh, groups with like nearly 7,000 patients so one group had was Ticacrolor 90 mg BT with aspirin. The other group was Ticacrolor 60 mg BT plus aspirin. And the third group was placebo with aspirin, in fact, okay? So what had happened was, uh, uh, like they tried to do a regular follow-up every four months, okay? Uh, up to one year and after that every six months they are doing the follow-up for that so to make you understand what happens is uh, yes so uh, after this okay if someone was already started on 90 mgpd so for the long-term maintenance dose for those patients they try to decrease it after one year it was decreased to 60 mg in fact for the long-term therapy and the primary efficacy endpoints were almost the same like so the, uh, it was composite of the cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, or stroke. Similarly, the primary safety endpoints were TME defined major bleeding, in fact. So what did they observe? So I, I have already said to you about the inclusion criteria, right? About the age, if they are diabetics as well, they enroll them like someone already having a multivessel coronary artery disease or even spontaneous myocardial infarction. Uh, as well, if someone is having uh, the, uh, even they try to enroll the chronic uh, non-end stage renal dysfunction. So the patients, for example, having a creatinine clearance less than 60 ml per minute as well, they try to include such patients as well. 
The data has been really, really interesting, which appeared in the NGM, in England Journal of Medicine, in 2015. So what they tried to see was on a Kaplan Meier curve. So what is happening is with the passage of time, what do we notice? Like up to three years, we can see the study, right? So up to three years. So what is happening? So what is happening is, of course, there's a significant reduction. There's a big reduction in the numbers on the parameters of myocardial infarction, cardiovascular death, and also stroke. However, so for example, they try to compare between the two groups. One is a placebo, and the other one was ticagrelor 60 mg BD. Isn't it? So there's a big benefit of those patient group, whoever was taking the uh, whoever was taking the ticket draw. So similarly, now the common question comes is, how about the individual parameters? Okay, we saw on those on an overall basis. So what type of plot is this? I have already said earlier as well in a lot of uh, statistical analysis. So the first one, I, as I said it, that was a kaplan meier curve. And this one is, what type of curve is it? So this is what is called as a forest plot. So for this plot as well, you try to see which side is better. Is it favoring the Tikakri law better or the placebo group was better? So we can see those dots and all over here. They tend to favor the Tikakri law in fact, right? So they try to see it over here. And what, what was seen over here is it is tending to favor the Tikakri law in fact in a better way. And what was happening is, that is the reason the European lab label of Ticagre law, the EMA, European Medical Agency, approved the European label and which recommends that the initial one-year treatment with the Ticagre law, 90 mg should be given like, uh, if someone has had an acute coronary syndrome, you should give 90 mg BD. But after one year, you can continue. But you have to reduce the dosage. How much you have to reduce? You have to give us 60 mg BD. Okay. So this is something really important thing, uh, which was which came in the EMA, in fact. And this study also came in. Uh, it was published in August 2017, in fact. And they saw the said as well is the treatment can be initiated up to two years from the myocardial infarction or even within one year after stopping the previous ADP receptor inhibitor treatment. So do you understand? So, so someone already has had a myocardial infarction and later on as well, like even up to two years, you can start uh, the patient with law. And however, within the first year, you have to give like 90 milligram BD in the ACS patient. And later on, uh, for chronic management or continuation therapy, you should give us 60 mg BD. So in the uh, European level as well, they try to see how is the effect. So for example, if we look carefully on this p-value on the parameters of cardiovascular death, within the all-cause mortality, the p-value is very much significant. And in fact, the ticagrelor tends to result in relative risk reduction of nearly 29% in cardiovascular death and 20% in all-cause mortality, isn't it? So now let's try to ask you all, who all have already been there for so long, what did you learn from today's presentation? You can use again the chat box and you can write it up. So what did you learn from today's presentation? So that's really important. And I really um, appreciate that you all attended, of course, the presentation session. But what did you learn from this? So we, what we learned was, as I already said it to summarize, yes, um, the risk of uh, the, the, the ch chances of mortality and morbidity in a patient, someone who has had a myocardial infarction tends to go very high. If someone is having a diabetes, the, ten, the risk tends to further increase as well. 
And that is where we had been thinking that there is a big role of antiplatelets. Antiplatelets, like I showed you the big classification, there's, there are a lot of antiplatelets which are being used, uh, especially the ones which is orally available, like the clopidogrel, prasogrel, and ticagrelor. And then always the common question comes is, because right now in this time what we practice is called is evidence-based medicine. If you can show the evidence and that is what you are supposed to practice. If you can't show the evidence, uh, you, uh, then the things are very much outdated. And that is what you have to do. So what you do is, you try to see is uh, uh, on the various parameters like the cardiovascular death, the cumulative risk, the myocardial infarction, the stroke, or the composites as well. So when they have been trying to do a lot of those studies like the uh, PLATO study, the TIMI uh, study, in fact, uh, the all these studies as well, which I already showed it to you or discussed with you all, like the Pegasus TIMI population studies as well. So they have been trying to see all these parameters and the results has been very different when they try to see the mortality benefit and they also try to, in some of the studies, they try to compare clopidogrel versus prasugrel, then, uh, then also prasugrel versus ticagrel or, and prasugrel versus clopidogrel as well. So what happens is there was significant benefit in mortality when they tried to use the clopidogrel in fact, okay. And there was also considerable long-term morbidity and mortality remains in patient. I have already said it. Someone has had a myocardial infarction. It doesn't mean that in acute terms, if you treated them, so even in long term as well, they have will be having a high risk of morbidity and mortality. So that is why we need to be, we should be taking really, really good care of those patients whenever we are trying to manage them because of the risk of this morbidity and also mortality. So as I already said it, clopidogrel and prosogrel didn't have a significant impact on the cardiovascular mortality reduction if someone has already had a heart attack or, you know, ACS in fact. Yes, okay, good, good, good. So uh, that is where uh, the, some of the latest studies which came like plateau study in which which showed when you use a ticagrelor for such patients, there is a significant mortality benefit irrespective of initial treatment strategies. And in fact, when they try to see even up to two years of the myocardial infarction or within one year of stopping the previous ADP receptor inhibitor, they saw that not only it uh, reduces the mortality, but also the cardiovascular mortality and the all-cause mortality as well tends to improve in such kind of patients. Okay. Huh. So, are there any questions so far?